49. The Joy of Confession Psalm 32 is a psalm of confession, and about confession David says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guilt. When I kept silence, my bones waxed stole through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture is turned into drought of summer. Salah, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. Salah, for this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place, thou shalt preserve me from trouble, thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Silla, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go, I will guide thee with mine eye. Be not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bitten bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. This is a psalm of confession, and therefore of praise. There's a reason for this. In Christian terms, confession is also confession of faith. Psalm 32 is about the blessedness or happiness of forgiveness. Forgiveness is, in verse 1, declared to be the covering of sin. The forgiven man is he who comes honestly to God to confess and acknowledge his sin. Verse 2. The imputation of guilt is removed from him by God. A.F. Kirkpatrick very ably described the meaning of this. Forgiveness is also triply described. 1 as the taking away of a burden, compare John 1, 29, and the expression, to bear iniquity. 2. As a covering so that the foulness of sin no longer meets the eye of the judge and calls for punishment. 3. As the cancelling of a debt which is no longer reckoned against the offender, compare 2 Samuel 19, 19. The temporal consequences for sin may remain, as they did for David, but the eternal consequence was mercy and forgiveness. The reference to guile in verse 2 is to self-deception and dissimulation before God. David confesses that, for a time, guile was his stance, or at least silence, verse 3. As a result, he admits his bones wasted away, that is, his evasion had total consequences for his being. His health was affected. Sin aged him. Itchy Leopold rendered roaring in verse 3 as grieving. By refusing to confess his sin, David found sin to be a destructive force to his being. His body grew old. It was sin that brought death into the world by Adam's sin, and sin always works towards the death of the sinner and society. David's time of impenitence aged him. In verse 4, David says that day and night the judgment of God for his sin was upon him like a working death sentence. He felt like a man stranded in a desert place, parched for lack of water or moisture. He was withering away. David's way of recovery was his confession of his sins. Instead of deception, he resolved on confession as the course of hope. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. David asked nothing of God, rather he simply confessed his transgression, and God forgave the iniquity of my sin. The iniquity, or guilt of his sin, was a very great one. In no way was a human solution possible. Yet God, in his sovereign mercy and grace, forgave David. David Having been forgiven at once appeals to all sinners to seek God's forgiveness also. The godly must pray to the Lord. They must seek his forgiveness. If they do so, surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Verse 6. 
God is a refuge and hiding place of sinners saved by grace. The Lord preserves them from trouble, so that, even in the face of grievous consequences, the most notable fact is that God compasses us with songs of deliverance. Verse 7. Thus, the man who truly and honestly confesses his sin goes from a physical decline into being surrounded with jubilant songs of deliverance. Confession affects a transformation. In verses 8 and 9, God instructs the believer. Leopold translates these lines ably. I shall instruct you and teach you the way which you shall go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like the horse or a mule without insight, whose mouth must be filled with a bit and bridle, else one cannot approach them. Apart from God, we behave like unruly animals. God keeps his eye upon us to keep us from the evil or rebellion in us. As Kirkpatrick commented, the man who will not listen to God's teaching becomes brutish. The reference to the mule is an ironic one because being mulish meant then and means now being intractable. As J. A. Alexander noted, the mule is, among various notions, a proverbial type of stubborn persistency in evil, and we find analogous allusions to the horse in Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 8 and chapter 8 verse 6. The reference to animal stress is the irrationality of sin. In verse 10, David stresses that the contrast is between unconfessed sinners and confessing sinners. Quote, Here again, we may observe that the antithesis is not between the wicked and the absolutely righteous, but between the wicked and the man trusting in Jehovah, and that the effect ascribed to this trust is not the recognition of the man's inherent righteousness, but his experience of God's mercy, which implies that he is guilty and unworthy of himself, and can only be delivered from the necessary consequences of his sin by simply trusting in the mercy of the very being whom he has offended. End quote. This is the heart of the matter. We are all sinners, and we can only be delivered from the necessary consequences of sin by confession. In verse 11, the psalm ends with a note of joy. True confession restores a right relationship with God, and it is health to all our being. Instead of storing up wrath by impenitence, we, by confession, enter into the joy and freedom of grace. All godly men are called upon to share in the joy of the burdened soul and in gratitude for God's grace to his people. Paul, in Romans 5, tells us that even as death came into the world by one man's sin, Adam's, so by one man's atoning work shall the gift of righteousness reign in life. God's grace to us in Christ's atoning work should always arouse in us thanksgiving and joy. Our life in Christ gives us the privilege of confession as a step in the revocation of sin and death into the life of a confessing faith in the service of Christ's kingdom.